into chapter 2 as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, Paul writes, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, to pass by way of you to Macedonia, and to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you is Christ and has anointed us, Excuse me, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who is made sorrowful by me? So in this section of Paul's letter, Paul is explaining to his Corinthian readers the reason that he did not come to them in the manner and time that he had previously told them that he would. There were those, it seemed, who were calling him, his sincerity and his, his authority, into question. And this gave occasion for Paul to explain and defend the reasons that he changed his plans. And Paul had said to them, look, I'm going to Macedonia, and I'm going to come and visit you on my way to Macedonia. And then as I return from Macedonia and go down into Judea, I'll stop and see you again. That way you can have a, a second benefit or a double blessing, if you will. So we'll get to see each other twice. That was Paul's intention. But it seems that Paul had received word that his original letter had ruffled some feathers, that, that his stern words to them had frustrated and upset some and that there was a painful visit that occurred. And so as Paul is, is setting out on his journey, rather than going to Corinth initially as intended, he realized that such a visit would just bring pain to them, and it was something that he did not want to do. Not that he was avoiding the conflict, but that he did not want to hurt them any more than he already had. And so Paul is saying that it was to spare their feelings that he changed his plans, And yet there were those in Corinth at the time who were criticizing Paul and who were questioning his integrity, who were questioning his authority. Now, normally Paul might have let this slight go. He might have said, they can question my integrity all they want. It doesn't matter. I don't care what they think of me. But Paul knew and understood that he was the one who had planted and established the church there, that he was the one who had first proclaimed the gospel to them. 
And if they began to doubt his credibility, his concern reasonably would be that they might also begin to doubt the credibility of the gospel that he had preached. And so he gives this justification for his actions to them and this defense of his word. Let's take a closer look at this section of Paul's letter, starting in verse 12. Paul begins, for our boasting is this. In other words, he says, listen, I'm going to tell you, and this may sound like boasting, but this is the reality of the situation. The testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in this world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. He says, listen, I have a clean conscience regarding the things that I told you. I was not using worldly wisdom. I wasn't trying to be sneaky. I wasn't trying to tell you one thing and do another in order to manipulate you. That was not my intention at all. Again, for we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. In other words, I'm, I, I'm not speaking with a double tongue here. There's no hidden meaning to what I'm saying. I'm being straight with you. I'm telling you the truth, and I'm just being upfront and honest with you. He says, now I trust you will understand even to the end. And let, in other words, hear me out, right? I, I trust that you'll understand. Listen to what I have to say here. As also you have understood us in part that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul is saying, listen, I love you and you are my boast in the Lord just as I am your boast in the Lord. In other words, Paul is saying, guys, we are on the same team. We are not in opposition to one another. When I stand before the Lord, I want to be able to say, look at my brothers. And just in the same way, I want you to be able to say, look at Paul. Look, look at how much he loved us and how much we loved him. We are one another's boast in the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Right? We are to be known by our love. And we are one another's boast in the Lord. When the Lord looks at us, he should look at how we treat one another and say, ah, those are my kids right there. They get it. They understand. They love each other just as I love them. Now, Paul is and was sincere in his desire to see them once on his way to Macedonia and once more on his way back. From there, as he headed to Judea, and that's what he's referring to when he wrote that there would be a second benefit. He wanted to see them twice. He desired to see them twice. But the tension in the relationship was such that Paul recognized that maybe they needed a little time away from each other before they saw each other again. Have you ever had or experienced that in a relationship in your own life? Yeah, maybe. Someone that you've had a disagreement with, someone that has become frustrated with you or with whom you have become frustrated and you know that you love them and you know that they love you. But right now, at least for the moment, you need a little space. How many of y'all have been there? Paul is essentially saying, you know, you Corinthians, man, I love you, but I'm just not quite ready to see you yet. And what's more, I don't think they were quite ready to see him yet at that point because the words with which he had rebuked them were still stinging and they needed time to set in. And so Paul, though he had intended to see them, has decided that, you know, we need to hold off for just a little bit. But he was sincere. Verse 15, we read, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia and to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly or the things that I plan? Do I plan according to the flesh? that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful and our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Paul did not say one thing while meaning another. 
He said what he meant when he told him his plans, but we all must acknowledge, as Paul does here, that sometimes plans have to change, right? Sometimes plans don't work out the way that we thought they would. And we, as human beings and as followers of Jesus Christ, need to learn the practice of holding on to our plans with an open hand, right? I've often said that the disparity between expectation and delivery can be measured by disappointment or resentment, right? That if I have an expectation that is up here, but when the reality arrives, it's actually down here, that, that disparity or that gap is the degree of disappointment, frustration, or resentment that I feel. And disappointment, frustration, and resentment generally try to find a place to perch. They try to find someone to blame, don't they? We are to hold our plans in an open hand, that they would be subject to change according to the will of God. Paul understood this, and the scriptures testify of it. In Proverbs 16, 9, we read that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Amen? Amen. In Proverbs 37, 23, we read that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. In other words, when I am walking and God redirects my steps and I have to go another way than I thought I was going to go, or I have to do something that maybe I thought I wasn't going to have to do, I can actually delight in my way because I know that God is in control of it. Whenever I go through something in life, whenever I face a difficulty or a trial or a challenge, I can look at that difficulty, trial, or challenge and say to myself, God has something for me even in this. Amen? And there is a peace and a confidence and a rest that comes in that acknowledgement. In Jeremiah 10, 23, the prophet wrote, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Amen. James has a great deal to say about it. I've read these passages to you before, if you've been here for any amount of time, but they bear repeating. Turn with me to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, James rebukes those who hold tightly to their own plans and leave no room for the redirection of God's spirit or the realization of God's will. In James chapter 4, starting in verse 13, we read, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Listen, there is nothing wrong with making plans. In fact, making plans are a good thing. We are to count the cost of our decisions. We are to seek God's will and his guidance in all things. And there's nothing wrong with saying, listen, this is what I'm planning to do. I'm, gonna, I'm going to invest here or I'm going to build here. In fact, one of the greatest things you can do is plant a tree, the fruit of which you will never live to eat. Amen? Because when you do that, you're planning and investing in the generation that is to come after you. And that is a good thing. But these plans that we make, these goals that we have must always be subject to the will of God. Amen? 
They must be subject to the will of God. And we need to acknowledge that. That's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding in all of our ways to acknowledge him. And when we do that, we can trust that he is going to direct our paths. Amen? Amen. We, we had a situation very much like that when we had to decide where to move when our previous building was going to be destroyed. You know, um, there's a story there that I could tell, a story that would be familiar to some and unfamiliar to many. And I hesitate to tell it because I don't want to take any time away from where we are or what we're doing, but I'll, I'll put it in a nutshell if I can. When this church first started way back in 2003, we were meeting in a funeral home. That's where we met. And it was a funeral home in Burleson, and the people there were so incredibly kind to us. When we asked them if we could use their facility, they said, absolutely, you can use our facility. When do you want to use it? And we said, well, when, when is it available? And they said, well, you're a church, right? So wouldn't you want it on Sunday mornings? And we're like, sure. You want to let us use it on Sunday mornings? That's great. How much is it going to cost? And they're like, no, nothing. It's free. You can use it for free. That's fine. And we were just blown away by their generosity toward us. Not only did they allow us to use their facility for free, but they paid one of their employees to show up every Sunday morning, unlock the door for us, sit there while we had our service, and lock up after we left. They were actually spending their own money to allow us to use their facility for free. How gracious and how kind that was. But even in the midst of that provision, there were times that it was difficult, right? It was difficult, uh, particularly as it pertained to our children's ministry, because we had the chapel for our Sunday morning service, but we really didn't have a place to put the kids aside from one of the viewing rooms that they allowed us to use, which was fine, provided they were unoccupied. It got a little weird one Sunday when my oldest son went to his Sunday school teacher and said, teacher, there's a dead body in the next room. <laughs> and there was, right? He had wandered into the wrong room and there was somebody that was there prepared for a viewing that was going to take place later that evening. So it became obvious that we needed a different place. We needed another space. And uh, I was on my way to a pastor's conference with my pastor, Pastor Bill Quinn, and he had come and picked me up and we were headed out of Burleson and we passed by a, uh, we passed by a, a, a church building. It was a, 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 an old church building. Those of you who've lived in Burleson for a while, you remember the old First Methodist Church there in Burleson had a bunch of stained glass windows that looked just like that one right there that Becky painted for us. And, uh, and Bill looked at that building that was for sale and he said, you should call them and see if they'll let you sublease their building while, you know, while, you, uh, while they're trying to sell it. And I told him, I said, Bill, there's no way they're going to let me do that. I said, they want a million dollars for that building. Keep in mind, this was over 20 years ago. And they wanted a million dollars for that building. And I said, there's no way. He says, you should just call him. He says, you, don't, you never know. You never know what God's going to do. And I'm like, I don't think it's going to. He says, just call him. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll call him whatever, I'll, I'll do it. So I called the realtor and I said, hey, listen, you know, we're a church in town and we would like to sublease this space. And he says, well, who are you again? And I told him who I was. And he says, and what is it that you want to do? And I told him what we wanted to do. And he says, well, he says, I'm sure they're going to have some questions. So why don't you give me a call back in a week or two and, and I'll, I'll let you know. And I'm like, okay, great. So I waited a week or two and I called him back. And it was like I was talking to him for the first time all over again. Same questions, same rigmarole. Well, you know, they're going to have some questions and so forth and so on. Give me a call in a couple weeks. So a couple weeks later, I call him again. Again, the same thing. And, I, you know, I'm ready to just give up, right? I'm like, I knew it wasn't going to happen anyway, so it's not going to happen. But the Lord put it on my heart to try one more time. And so I did. And I called, but instead of calling the realtor, I decided to call the church office. Because, of course, the First Methodist Church was still in town. They had just moved to a new facility that they had built. And so I called, and I spoke to the secretary, and I said, listen, um, you know, we're interested in maybe leasing your building. Who would I need to talk to about that? And she says, oh, you'd need to speak to Ms. Franklin. She's uh, the chairman of our board of trustees. And I said, great. Well, can I get her number? She gave me the number, and I called her up. And I told her, I said, Ms. Franklin, listen, um, my name's Ken Davis. I'm the pastor at Calvary Chapel here in Burleson. And 
and um, we're interested in, in leasing your facility while you guys try to sell it, but your realtors told us that you have some questions um, that you would need us to answer before you make a decision. So, you know, I was wondering if maybe I could just answer those directly for you. And she said to me, what are you talking about? And I said, well, your realtor said that you had questions. She's like, I haven't heard anything about this. The realtor had not said anything to them because he didn't want to lease the building. He wanted to sell the building. Long story short, they fired the realtor <laughs> and they leased the building to us. Don't feel bad for him though. He later ran for political office and was elected to the state assembly where he served for a number of terms. So yeah, don't feel too bad for him. So eventually, they did put the building back up for sale. We were in it for about a year. before They took it off the market. About a year later, they put it up for sale again, and eventually it sold to the city, and we leased from the city. And eventually, the city leased it to Hill College, and we leased from Hill College. We were in that building, which was larger than this, huge fellowship hall, full kitchen, lots of classrooms, beautiful space. We were there for 17 years. Yeah, we were there for 17 years. But the more the building changed hands, the less of the building we had. And the first thing we lost was the sign out front. So though we were there, most people didn't know that we were there. Most of you that are here that have come and started visiting since we came to this facility are here because you probably saw us as you drove by and you saw the sign. And that's something that we did not have at our old location. But as time passed, it became evident that we had fallen into a rut. We had. I had fallen into a rut. I had become lackadaisical in my approach to the ministry. Things had become very routine. Midweek service, Sunday morning service, midweek service, Sunday morning service, the occasional you know, outreach or whatever. But, but there was a lack of, I don't want to say there was a lack of life in the body, but we had grown stagnant. Can I just confess that? We'd become stagnant. And there are lots of things that I could blame for that, personal struggles, difficulties, trials, many of which I've shared in the past, the, you know, the, the, the grind of being bivocational, all of those things. There were things, right? Things I could point to and say, this was the problem, that was the problem, this other thing was the problem. But the reality was we had just become too comfortable in our situation. And... We received word probably about a year and a half to two years before it actually happened that the city was going to sell the building and that in selling the building, not only was it changing hands, but it was ultimately going to be destroyed, demolished, torn down which if you drive by uh, Fuzzy's Tacos and look to your right, that open field is where we were. Sad to say there was a church on that property since the late 1800s. And now it seems it's destined to become a parking lot. That's city planning for you, right? But God's purposes and plans go beyond what is convenient for us. And he knew that we needed something to push us out of the nest, to move us out of our comfort zones and into a place where we truly needed to trust in him again and rely on him again and recognize that we were not sufficient in and of ourselves to meet the need that was set before us. Because you see, for those 17 years that we were in that building, our rent never changed. We paid $2,000 a month every month. It included utilities and it never went up. Let me say, friends, we were spoiled. And when we began to look for an alternate facility, when we began to look for a place to meet, we suddenly realized just how blessed we had been to have such an affordable place to fellowship and to meet. And there was no place that we could find that was within our budget. There was no place that we could find that would allow us to continue to do as we had done. And so we began to look and eventually this place was found and there are stories behind its finding but let me just say that even this, as we looked at this space, we realized it was way more than we could afford. 
But we gathered together as a leadership team in my living room one day and we prayed and we worshiped the Lord and we sought God and we came to the realization that we needed to trust him, that he either was going to do what he said he was going to do or we weren't in his will and we needed to acknowledge that. And so the decision was made after seeking the Lord to lease this facility and praise God, we've not missed the rent one time. God has provided each and every month, even though the amount that we pay now is more than three times what we were paying before. And when we stepped into the lease, we had no idea if we were going to be able to do it. And yet God has been faithful. You see, our plan was to stay where we were. God said, no, I have other plans for you. And his plans for us were way better than our plans for ourselves because if we had done what we wanted to do and been able to stay where we were doing things the way that we were doing them, the vast majority of you would not be sitting here today. And we're blessed to have you. We're excited to see what God is doing in and through this fellowship. And now we come to a place where though there's still room to sit out here, our classrooms are overflowing. And the facility right next door, the space right next door has suddenly and unexpectedly become available. And so we're looking at that saying, Lord, is that your will? And we can plan and we can say, yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna lease this space next door. We're gonna knock a hole in this wall right here, put a doorway there. We'll have extra kitchen space, a big fellowship area, more classroom space, extra bathrooms. From a worldly perspective, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But here's the thing. If it isn't what God wants for us, I don't want it, right? We can make our plans, but God is the one who directs our steps. That door is not a door we're going to force open. It will open if he wants it to open. And if he doesn't want it to open, we are not going to try to beat it down. Does that make sense? We have to be faithful to allow God to lead us. And Paul understood that. Paul could say to the Corinthians, I'm going to stop by and see you guys on the way to Macedonia. And then when I come back from Macedonia, I'm going to stop by and see you again. But when the time comes and it's actually the point at which he has to make that turn to head down the road to Corinth and the testimony of the Spirit says, Paul, they're not ready to see you yet. Paul has to say, you know what? Okay. Okay. Not what I want, Lord, what you want. Not what I think ought to happen, but Lord, what you think ought to happen. And this was not the first time Paul had had experiences with this sort of thing. Paul's plans had been diverted through the work of the Holy Spirit on probably many more than one occasion, but on one in particular, we actually have a written record of it in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 16 with me. In Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 9, we read, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Amen? Paul is moving, man, he's on that missionary journey. He's headed, he's like, oh, we're going to go over here. And the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not. He's like, oh, okay, fine, we'll, we'll go over here. And the Holy Spirit says, uh-uh, no, not there either. And he's directed through the leading of the Spirit, and in this instance, even through a dream, to where the Spirit wanted him to go. Now, some of us are so stubborn that when we set our minds on something, we decide that's what we're going to do. It's like the Holy Spirit has to pry it from our fingers in order to redirect us. But that wasn't Paul. Paul was sensitive to the leading of the Spirit in his ministry. And that is an example that we are to follow. We need to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. We can have plans. It is responsible to have plans. 
but we are not to be so dead set on our own plans that we become insensitive to the leading of the Spirit and will adjust our plans to His. That's what we need to be able and willing to do. Amen? Now, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 23, we read, Moreover, I call God as a witness against my soul, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who is made sorrowful by me? In these verses, Paul explains the reason that he did not come to them as he had intended to. He didn't come to them in order to spare them from what would have been a very painful visit, both for him and for them. So his motivation was being obedient to the Spirit, and he was motivated by love. Amen? By love and care and compassion for them. But now I want to go back to the verses that I skipped just a moment ago and take a closer look at verses 20 and 21 because these contain some very profound statements that reach far beyond Paul's explanation for his delayed visit and share with us some vital principles relating to our faith. In verse 20 and 21, we read, that Paul says, for all the promises of God in him, that is in Jesus Christ, are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Amen? Amen? Powerful verses. All the promises of God in him, that is all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes. And in him, amen. To the glory of God through us. The promises of God find their fulfillment in and through Jesus Christ. And we become partakers of those promises. We become beneficiaries of those promises through our identification with Christ. He agrees. It is our identification with Christ that allows us to be part of the family of God. It is our identification with Christ that makes us the recipient of God's bountiful blessings. Amen? Amen. Now, here are just a few. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but let's look at just a few of the promises that we are the recipients of because of our identification with Jesus Christ. In James chapter 2, verse 5, James writes, Listen, my beloved brethren, Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Amen? Do you love God this morning? If you love God this morning, God has promised that you are a part of the kingdom, that you are a recipient of the kingdom, an heir of the kingdom of God because you love him. That was his promise. In James chapter 1, verse 12, we read, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, another promise for those who love God. You have been promised a kingdom and you have been promised a crown. Is that amazing? You've been promised that you are, the promise that has been given to you is that you are an heir of the kingdom of God and that he will bestow upon you the crown of life. Amen. What a blessing that is. 
In Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, when those who heard Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost asked what they should do, Peter replied to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Amen? Amen. He has promised you to, he has promised to make you an heir of the kingdom. He has promised to give you the crown of life. And he has promised to bless you with the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Wow. Now, of course, there are and will be those who claim that God does not keep his promises or that he is slow in keeping his promises. Peter addresses this in no uncertain terms in 2 Peter. Turn there with me, if you will. I can hear the kids. What a blessing. You know, I'm gonna, this is an aside, just for a moment, okay? There are churches out there that want to maintain a pristine experience in the worship service. I get it. I get it. They, they don't want disturbances because they understand that the teaching of God's word is so vitally important. I went to a church one time where once the service has begun, those doors, they were locked. You, you had to watch from the lobby on the video screen because they didn't want people coming into the service and disrupting it in any way, shape, or form. I appreciate and understand the reverence and the respect that they have toward the teaching of God's word. But y'all, we're family, yeah. right? This is family. I don't mind the sound of those kids. I don't mind it at all. There was a post, this is a total aside. I shouldn't even be going here, but it just <laughs> poop, pop, you know. There was a post on a social platform where it was like senior pastors only, you know. And someone brought up um, a question that they were asking the rest of us. And they said, uh, you know, I've got this guy who wants to come and visit our church, but, but he has a, um, he has a um, what do you call it, um, a, a dog, uh, what, what, an, emo an emotional support animal, right? And he said, he wants to bring this in, and I just feel like it's a mistake, and I don't think that we should, because you know, I don't want to have a dog in the sanctuary or in the service. It'll be a disruption and all of this. And there were some of us who replied and said, look, man, it is far more important that that person be made to feel welcome and loved than it is for you to maintain the pristine nature of, of your service. You know what I'm saying? Because you know what? This is not about some performance this is not about you being entertained. This is about you being edified and equipped. And this is about living life together, right? And sometimes, I don't know if you notice this or not, but living life together can be messy. So I think it's far better to recognize that and to embrace it than it is to become irritated by it. So I hope the kids continue to have fun back there. That's, that's all I had to say about that. I'm sorry. I don't know why I went off on a tangent there. Second Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 4, I guess it would help if I was in 2 Peter. Hold on a second. I'm in 1 John. That's not the right place. No, it's not 2 Peter. Yeah, it's not chapter 4. Sorry. 3. Chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Beloved... I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering, in other words, he is patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Amen? Amen? New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are looking forward to that thing because that is something else that God has promised us. The day of judgment, the day of the perdition of ungodly men, it is coming. And they may look at it and they may say, oh, well, you know, everything's gone on the same as it has since the beginning of time. Where is the promise of his coming? You guys have been saying that Jesus is coming back forever. And yet, where is he? We don't see him. Everything is just the same as it's always been, so they say. And they do say it. But they are mistaking God's patience for laxness. They are mistaking his long-suffering desire to see them come to salvation for his unwillingness to keep his promises. God is not unwilling to keep his promise. There will be a new heaven and a new earth because that which is will be destroyed. The thing is, we don't know when. We don't know when it's going to happen. And so we hold those plans also with open hands, right? When we look at prophecy, sometimes we have these expectations that, well, it has to happen like this and like this and like this. But God says, you know what? Even the son doesn't know the day or the hour. Only the father who's in heaven. And our expectations are that he will come and that when he comes, he will come suddenly. But we need to not be discouraged because he hasn't come yet. As I always like to say, I guarantee that one of two things is going to happen in your lifetime. Either he will return for his church or we will die and go to meet him in his kingdom, right? One of the two is destined to happen and which one it is, is, is just a question of God's timing and God's purpose. Turn with me one last time to look at one more uh, set of promises, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll stay right here in 2 Peter, but just go to 2 Peter chapter 1 because I want to really bring home this idea that God has promised us these things, that he has anointed us, that he has sealed us with his spirit. That idea of being sealed with his spirit means that he has put his impression upon us and he has claimed us. We belong to him. The Holy Spirit that he has given us is a down payment upon the glory that one day we will share with him in his kingdom. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, we read, these words, starting in verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us 
all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you see that right there? All things, not some things, not most things, all things that pertain to life and godliness, God has already given you in Christ Jesus. Amen? As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, that's Jesus Christ, by which we have been given or by which have been given to us, by whom? By Jesus, amen? By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, amen? That through these, through those promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen? We are partakers of the divine promises of God. And through these promises, God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. As Paul would write in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Amen. A guarantee of what? A guarantee of his promises. A guarantee of the kingdom that he has promised to give you. A guarantee of the crown of life that he has promised to those who love him. Amen. We are recipients of these divine promises and he has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of his word. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.